Hi, it's Jan Beta, and today I have a very special treat for you as well as for me in the lab here. This super early Amiga 500. This actually is quite the historic piece and it might just be one of the earliest Amiga 500s on record. Definitely one of the earliest on YouTube. And we're going to take a closer look at this today and see just how much of a museum piece this really is. This was lent to me by Stefan from Belgium who trusts me to send it back to him, which I am definitely going to do after inspecting this. Uh, it was probably sold originally in Belgium. It has the French text on here and it has the European Amiga 500 box. Allegedly, this is the original box it came in when it was sold. And there's actually quite some backstory that I'm going to tell you during this video that Stefan sent me about this thing. Yeah, first of all, I want to take this out of this box, obviously, and take a look at the machine itself. And yeah, it comes with some cables that are maybe original even, I'm not sure. This is a SCART cable that's probably not original. This is a mouse that's definitely not original. It's a quick shot mouse, not the original tank mouse, but it also came with the tank mouse that might very well be the original tank mouse that this came with. And it came with the original power supply this came with uh, that has some cable burn. It's labeled 5th November 1987, which would make this a relatively early one, but not the earliest one on record. So probably it's not the one this came with, as we're going to see. And the Amiga itself. I'm going to take this out of the box and show you. So here it is. At first glance, this looks just like any other Amiga 500, but there are some things that point towards this being a very early model. Stefan found this when it was listed in the local classifieds in October 2022 in Belgium. And at first, he wasn't that interested in this even. He uh, went to the seller and it was listed for 120 euros with a lot of retro stuff, including a Commodore 1081 monitor and the mouse we've seen, the Quickshot mouse, hundreds of discs and some unrelated non-Amiga stuff. And yeah, he inspected this in person and wasn't that interested because he is more of a C64 person, which is understandable. <laughs> But he decided to take some pictures of it and when he posted those in an Amiga forum, people actually told him that this probably was a very early Amiga 500 model, which he didn't realize at the time. So he went back and bought it actually and that's how it ended up here. He decided to send it to me to show it to you and to do some work on it that I'm going to be very careful about because I really want to keep it in the state that it is in. The first hint that this may be a super early Amiga 500 is the serial number, which is 190. <laughs> and as you probably know and is uh, accessible on Wikipedia, etc., the first Amiga 500s that were sold were actually sold in Europe and made in Germany in Braunschweig, in the Commodore factory in Braunschweig. The production models of the A500 were actually first introduced at the CeBIT in Germany in March 1987 and went on sale sometime in May 1987 in Europe. And then a bit later they went on sale in the United States. The first Amiga 500s that were sold in Europe were actually sold in April 1987 in the Netherlands, which is super close to Belgium. And in May 1987 they sold them in all the other parts of Europe pretty much. The fact that this has French labels on the box means that it was probably sold in May 1987 in Belgium. The, the common language in Belgium is French actually. so. 
uh, that would make sense. But it still may actually be the 190th Amiga 500 that was made in Europe. There are several other things that point to very early Amiga 500. One of the most obvious ones is this uh, so-called Space Invaders keyboard, which has a Commodore key actually. Later Amigas had an Amiga key here. And also this has an Amiga key on the right side here, which is a solid Amiga logo character. The later models had an outlined Amiga character here and a solid one on the left side. The caps lock key also has, I think, a bigger cutout than on the later models. And this keyboard is actually, it's a slightly different construction than the later Amigas have. This is definitely an early Amiga 500 keyboard. As you can see, it has the American layout, which makes sense because the initial production run of the Amiga 500 probably had the American or international standard keyboard. There's another interesting point about this case. Uh, actually, this has a Commodore badge. There are versions of this case that have an embossed Commodore logo actually in this spot here, but it's not quite clear if those were the earliest versions or if this is the earliest version. As you can see, the Commodore logo is printed in quite fat print, so this may very well be <clears throat> the earliest incarnation of the Amiga 500 case. Also, if Commodore kept the tradition of putting a picture of early production models on the box, actually, like with the C64 that still had the early silver label Commodore 64s printed on the European boxes, even if the design changed after that. This, as you can see, has this badge logo here on the box and the boxes looked the same for the whole lifespan of the Amiga 500, the boxes that were sold here in Europe. I can show you my Amiga 500 box in a second that looks exactly the same except the text is in German because it was sold in Germany. So this is the box that my Amiga 500 came in that was definitely purchased sometime summer 1987 by my father and as you can see it has the exact same picture on here that the other one has, except it has this uh, sticker here in German. Otherwise, it's exactly the same box, albeit in quite a bit nicer condition than the other one. They are definitely the same box. Also, mine has a bit more color in the print here that might just be faded out on this one. The uh, text is faded out on the Belgian Amiga 500 as well. But otherwise, the uh, lettering and the picture are the exact same. And my Amiga 500 box also has the Space Invaders keyboard pictured on the box, although the Amiga 500 doesn't have this. It has the two Amiga keys instead of the Commodore key here. And this old Amiga 500 looks in rather nice condition. It has one little mod to the case, this uh, switch here which was put there to switch on and off the 512K memory expansion that was added at a later point in here. Stefan also put a disc in here. Doesn't want to come out. Ah, oh, there we go. Tarakin 2! It's always a good idea to put a disc in during shipping because otherwise the head might bump into something and uh, get dislocated or destroyed in the worst case. So. Clever thinking and also Turrican 2. I actually got my Amiga 500 out of the box to compare it and you can see some significant differences already, I think, from first glance. A, mine has the embossed Commodore logo here, but it doesn't have the Space Invaders keyboard. So mine has the solid Amiga key and the outlined Amiga key and also the caps lock LED cutout is a bit smaller and it has this embossed Commodore logo here. Also the keyboard layout is the German layout which has quirts actually with uh, the Z here and the Y in this position and it has the German umlauts. This also has a completely different sticker on here. This is the serial number 
uh, 123,512 and it has this embossed logo actually which says made in Germany and the model A500 and things like that. That is vastly different than on the other one which is interesting because I didn't remember. In comparison this has the center logo and it doesn't have the embossed logo at all. This is the Belgian one. So they are quite different even though they were probably produced pretty close in time to each other but this definitely seems to be an earlier one. So previously most people thought that the embossed logo, chicken lips, high-tech Mitsumi keyboard Amiga 500s were the earliest ones and actually I've not seen a chicken lips Amiga 500 with this uh, case with the badge with this bolder chicken lips logo on it. But the theory is that these were the earlier ones than the embossed logo ones, which my Amiga 500, which is a relatively early model, also would confirm because that has the emb embossed logo as we've seen. Yeah, the most significant differences are obviously going to be under the hood. Also, this case feels a bit thicker than the one my Amiga came in, probably because it's an earlier version of this. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to take this apart very carefully and take a look inside. So if this really is an early Amiga 500, it should have a super early revision mainboard in it. The first ones that were sold were revision 3 mainboards, so I suspect that's what's in here. My Amiga 500 from later in the same year already had a revision 5 mainboard. The revision 3 has some flaws that Commodore quickly fixed. Also interestingly this has Torx screws for the case screws which I think some Amigas have Phillips screws, some have Torx screws, some only have Torx screws internally to hold the RF shield down and have Phillips screws on the outside. It varies a bit, <laughs> as usual with Commodore products. This one is all Torx on the outside. And as I said earlier, it had the memory expansion in it, but Stefan removed that because it had a leaky battery and it's also a slightly newer one from sometime in the early 90s probably. We're going to take a look at that too. Yeah, I'm going to be super careful with this and use a plastic sputter to separate the case parts. Hopefully not breaking anything. Yeah, yeah that looks kind of familiar except for the keyboard assembly, which is kind of a different construction. And Stefan also included this sticker that he found inside the case, which was just uh, freely floating around in there. Usually these were, I think, applied to the boards. And that's another serial number. And as you can see, it has an even earlier serial number, number 16 believe it or not. Unfortunately, it's no longer attached to the board, but this would point to a super early one. Maybe even the 16th that ever left the Braunschweig factory. The obvious differences in the keyboard assembly are that this has a rivet here, as well as several stickers that are not present on later models. This is actually riveted together. And it also has these capacitors on the little keyboard controller chip that's in here, which has a date code from the 52nd week of 1986 even. So this was produced in late 1986, which would also point to this being an incredibly early model. And it has these fixes which were probably applied to fix some timings. I'm not quite sure if these chips changed at all. They still used these chips in the later keyboard assemblies. This one is socketed, which later models weren't. Yeah, this definitely is an early chip that they used here. They didn't need these for the Amiga 1000, I think. They used these for the Amiga 2000 and the 500, which were first introduced to the public in January 1987 at the CES show of that year. And this was produced shortly before that even. 
Wow. Sorry if I'm getting slightly enthusiastic about this, but uh, this really is a piece of history, computer history. So I'm carefully going to disconnect the keyboard here and put it somewhere safe. Okay, another significant difference in the keyboards is that this actually has a proper PCB instead of the membrane that the later models have. So this is the high-tech version of the keyboard. Revision B actually. And it has a date code on here saying it's from the seventh week of 1987. So very early 1987. Probably the chip was produced in advance and then they put it together the seventh week of 1987. And the case indeed is significantly thicker than the later models. This feels a lot more sturdy, so they used a lot more plastic for this. It's also quite a bit heavier than the ones I'm used to. You can probably see that this is a different mold uh, by looking at these fins here, which are constructed in a way sturdier way than on the later ones. Interesting. And also these ridges are a lot thicker. I don't know if you can see that. They are thicker and uh, like more sturdy. They don't feel as wobbly as the later models. Mine included. Yeah, the bottom case is a bit thicker too. Doesn't feel as wobbly. This is the switch that got added for the memory expansion. This is not original, as you can probably tell. The disk drive is an early model as well. This is a Matsushita JU363, which is very uncommon in later Amiga models. I've not seen one of these. Made in Japan, as was usual for disk drives at that point in time. Serial number W87B. So definitely made in 1987. The real serial number is 069612. And there's also something 292, which is probably maybe a modification to make it work with the Amiga standards. I'm not sure what that means. If anybody knows more about anything I say in this video, please put it in the comments. This is really archeology. span So uh, if you have any information about these that you want to add, please put it in the comments. So I'm going to put my ESD safe wrist strap on before I do any more to this. I'm going to remove the RF shield now, which also has all Torx screws. And I think they are all the same so far, which is easy and also, also cheaper to manufacture, I believe. The RF shield seems to be exactly the same construction as with the later models I'm used to. Also this part which shields the expansion port here. So uh, there are these metal tabs that we have to bend out of the way. I'm going to be even more careful than usual with these. Don't want to damage this. This looks all intact so far, which is kind of amazing. And also there's very little rust on here. So carefully going to remove this. I think we can take it off. There we go. Wow. This is a super early mainboard, a revision 3. It doesn't even say revision 3 anywhere, I think. The chips all have super early date codes from what I can see. I'm going to show you some close-ups of this. It's beautiful. Famously, the Amiga 500 was internally called B-52 Rock Lobster by the engineers because they listened to the song Rock Lobster from the B-52s a lot during designing this PCB. And there's also an embossed Commodore logo with a quality control sticker in here. These boards were all assembled in Hong Kong at this point because Commodore had all their boards uh, assembled in Hong Kong, I believe, at that point. Let's take a look at some of those date codes. Well, this is third week of 1987. Seventh week of 87. This is one of the CIA chips, which seems to be an original one. And it also has a very old school MOS logo on here. MOS being the chip manufacturer for Commodore. 
which belonged to Commodore actually at that point. This also has a seventh week of 87 date code on it. I'm going to carefully remove the disk drive, uh, at least the cable, which reveals another CIA chip here which also has a date code from the seventh week of 87. I hope they used better sockets in this than they used on the later models, including my own Amiga. This, I think Gary has a fourth week of 87 date code even. And the Agnes chip has seventh week of 87 as well. The Kickstart ROM doesn't have any date code, but I think it's a 1.2 ROM, which was the one that the Amiga 500 and the Amiga 2000 initially shipped with. The Motorola 68000 processor has a date code of fourth week of 87. So actually this sticker here might point to 12th week of 87. So probably this was made in the 12th week of 87, which would still be super early. And it actually all points to this being the board this machine actually shipped with originally. It seems to be in rather nice condition. There are some things that I immediately see that could prevent this from working. This PLCC socket the Agnes chip sits in has some green spots on the contacts. I don't know if it shows on camera but I can definitely see some green spots on those contacts. And these PLCC sockets are not very reliable anyway so that might prevent this whole thing from starting up. Otherwise, I don't see any signs of damage and uh, very little dust <laughs> on here at all, which is kind of amazing considering its age and what it went through probably during its life. It seems to be a well-used machine, obviously, because the Amigas were just amazing at that point and uh, what fool would not use them? <laughs> As I kind of spoiled earlier, this Amiga unfortunately doesn't work anymore. It doesn't boot, it produces kind of a video sync signal, the lights come on briefly but then fade out. That's all from Stefan's uh, description of the fault. I didn't turn this on at all. I only did the things you saw me doing on this video so far. So my plan at this point is to try to resurrect this in a very careful manner. So I'm not going to do a full restoration, full recapping or anything like that, just to keep it as the museum piece that this definitely is. And I'm going to try to figure out if we can make this work again in a way that is not destructive to the historical value of this, which is maybe going to be a bit of a challenge. We're going to see. I think what I want to do is to uh, try to push the chips into the sockets a bit. They all seem to be pretty nicely seated. Uh, maybe try to clean this up at first, but I think we might have to replace the socket in the long run to make this work. This seems to be the most obvious thing that I can see from first glance here that may cause this whole th system to not start up properly. There may be other things, there might be an issue with the power supply. I think the first thing I want to try is to put some contact cleaner on here in this socket and also in this power socket and try to clean that up a bit so we are going to be sure that it has the correct voltages everywhere. I'm going to measure those on the chips and then I'm probably going to dare hooking this up to a power supply. Not the one it came with but my known good power supply to see if we get anything from this which would be amazing. As I said these PLCC sockets are not reliable at all even in newer Amigas. I'm just going to wiggle the chip slightly here. And maybe we can make it, make contact again. Also spraying some contact cleaner into the power socket, which is often a cause for problems if that doesn't make good contact. The Agnes basically is like the center of the system which switches signals and memory access between things. So that might very well be an issue. 
I'm going to try to clean it as well as I can. Removing these PLCC chips from these sockets usually puts a lot of stress on these sockets, which I definitely want to avoid. Worst case, we're going to have to replace that socket, but maybe I can clean it up with uh, some contact cleaner and some alcohol. This is isopropanol and an anti-static brush. Yeah, I think I already got some of the green stuff off there. It seems to be just surface corrosion, thankfully. So I'm just going to try that without removing any chips, without doing anything else. Just some cleaning. So I cleaned the sockets a bit with some contact cleaner that I added. I hooked up a known good SCART cable to my upscaler box and I'm going to use a known good Amiga power supply, which is one of the modern ones, the switching one. That's uh, the lighter version of these Amiga 500 power supplies. They are usually more reliable than the uh, heavier linear ones that the older Amiga 500s came with. I think we might want to power this on now. Without the floppy disk drive connected, without the keyboard connected, it should still uh, start up to the kickstart screen. If it works at all, that is, obviously. So, yeah, let's flick the switch and see what we get. We get no signal. That's not good. No signal at all. We don't even get video sync, which is kind of interesting. Okay, so something's utterly wrong with this. So unfortunately, it seems like this Amiga is going to require some more attention and dedication, which I'm going to give it in the next video. I hope I can carefully troubleshoot this, find the fault or the faults and make this boot happily again. That would be kind of amazing. And as this is going to be the last video for 2022 on this channel, let me just say a huge thank you to the community. Making these videos really kept me afloat through these challenging times. Uh, 2022 was a challenging year, I think, for many of you and for me as well. So uh, thank you so much for your support, emotional support, and for allowing me to make these videos. Hope to see you again in the new year. May it be a better one. I think I probably said the same thing in 2021, but uh, 2023 can only get better, hopefully. Thank you so very much for watching my stuff and for giving me some appreciation. Special thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon or on the channel memberships page. In case you want to give me some support, the links are in the video description. And you also give me support by just watching these videos and commenting. As I said, if you have anything to add to what I found out in this little archaeology session, please let me know in the comments. I'm happy to read every new bit of information that you can add to this. Hope to see you again on this channel sometime. I'm Jan Beta. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.